Jane, read Pony Pals. You've read this a million times already. It's one of your favorite gifts. Another gander at it sure couldn't hurt. Jane, examine contents. Amazing chapter titles. Potentially the TOC for greatest book ever written. But Betancourt shat out this nightmare instead. Contents. 1. A visitor. 2. Screaming ponies. Motherfuck. 3. Danger. Requires additional exclamation points. 4. Flames. 5. Missing. 6. The fight. 7. Blood in the snow. Holy shit. 8. Homeless. 9. Three ideas. 10. Acorn Shadow. Colon. A Pony Broods. 11. The Final Freakout. Appendix A. Official Body Count. Horseshoes. Yeah, whatever. Jane. Flip to page one. One. Tragic Pony Noose. A Visitor. Anna Harley, almost a good name for you, not sure why. Dumb name, sounds like product of speech impediment by imbecile. Came out her back door and ran across the backyard. There were two ponies in the paddock behind Anna's house and yard. Hey ponies, Anna called out, we're going for a trail ride. As she prepared the noose adroitly, Anna's pony, Acorn, was standing in the pony shed. The other pony, Lil Sebastian belonged to Anna's next door neighbor and pony pal, uh, the city of Pawnee, Indiana. Lil Sebastian came over to Anna, but Acorn stayed in the shed. Anna thought that Acorn was trying to hide from her. He liked to play, I'm scared shitless of my master. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Man, screw handwriting, this is so much easier. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry. I really love this section a lot. Okay. Anna went into the shed. <laughs> Acorn wasn't fucking around. He was staring at a fluffy black cat with white paws, taking a dump in his favorite saddle. The cat staring back at Acorn, shitting like tomorrow wasn't a thing. Hey, kitty, said Anna. What are you doing here? She asked with the act of defecation, oddly foreign to the girl. Pawnee came into the shed behind Anna. Whose cat is that? The rural township inquired. I don't know, answered Anna. It's not a pony, so here, so seriously, who gives a fuck? Suddenly a mouse ran from behind the feed bin. The contrived incident caused some extra shit to happen. Acorn was like, oh hell no, not the fucking my paddock, bitch. Acorn nickered as if to say, vile slurs omitted. Um, I'm trying to see, uh, good, uh, good lord, it's, it ends with a K. It seems like it starts with a W, like, good work, good wink. The cat leaped back on the straw and curled himself into a ball. Acorn took a few steps toward the cat and crushed it to death with his magnificent hooves. Acorn nickered triumphantly. That's so cute, murmured the fictional Midwestern burrow. Pam Crandall rode another goddamn pony up to the shed. She said hi to her pony pals and the whole crew beamed complacently about their bullshit horse club. Anna pointed at the cat. Acorn has a new kind of meat he appears to tolerate, she exploded. Later, about halfway through the book, rather than see the gag through to the bitter end, Strider began pasting over entire pages of original text with his own completely rewritten version of the story, while keeping all the chapter titles. His revision is a tough, emotionally draining read, but it's quite cathartic, in all the worst ways possible. He tends to get carried away with his projects. Jane, just check out the file already. You try to distract yourself with Strider's literature, but it's no use. Your curiosity is overwhelming. Lalonde could be gone for hours, for all you know. Surely there couldn't be any harm in just installing the file, could there? Jane, you promised you would listen to your Biffsy, and you failed. I feel like this friend group is so much less tight-knit than John's friend group. Like, I don't know, I'm trying to think back. Like, is there a time... Were they, where, where, where the beta kids ever like lied to each other? I feel like, so like Jade hides 
her prospect prognostication. Uh, but at the same time, she never denies that it's there. She's just like, I can't explain this right now, and I'm sorry. Which is true. That's accurate. Um, and even even Dave, like, John's like, I think there's a monster in my house. And Dave's like, fuck yeah, of course there's a monster. Like, you're in a fucking, you're in a game, man. Like, fucking kick its ass, bro. Um, meanwhile, um, uh, Lalonde, our future Lalonde, has tried informing Jane of what her reality is like. And Jane's like, that doesn't seem true. And now Lalonde is like, don't run that file. And Jane is like, but what risk could it be? Especially after she promised she would li listen to her Biffsy. Spurb, client, tilde, ATH. Well, that's an odd extension for a file. You don't think you've ever seen it before. Jane, install the Spurb client. Spurb, version 000. Press enter when ready. It doesn't even seem to install anything. It just runs a small application when you execute it. Looks like you're one key press away from playing. Do you dare? Jane, press enter. Psst. Hey, Jane. Step away from er computer. <laughs> Pooter. <laughs> Cat smiley face. What? Where? Sweet catch. God, you wish stuff would stop exploding. And we already know that it's trivial code to a trivial ATH code to blow up a computer. God, you wish stuff would stop exploding. Jane, answer d -stry. I should probably warn you. About what, yet another exploding game trap? Well, shit, she already sent it. Yes, but to be fair, she warned me not to run it. That's weird. Why? She was probably just trying to protect me from the Batter Witch's latest assassination attempt. Sheesh, I can't believe you all finally got me to say Batter Witch 2. Who would have thought? No, it's weird because Lalonde was the one who rigged it to explode. It's a bogus copy she coded herself. The real game file she downloaded is totally legit. What, really? Got it right here myself, checked it out. File's fucking clean as a whistle. A whistle that overcame a major substance abuse problem, trying to get its life back on track. The whistle's holding down a steady job now, taking things one day at a time. Eat a fucking dinner off that whistle. Hmm? Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. Why would she do that? To accomplish exactly what it sounds like got accomplished. You narrowly averted the, the fake threat to your life, then getting your shit all hot and bothered at the baroness over it. Then you abdicate your heiress throne or something and give up on this game as a big fuck you to the genocidal cake alien. But if she felt so strongly that I shouldn't play, she could have told me, or told me more forcefully. I guess, I guess, I would have listened. Maybe she's working through some problems right now really doesn't want us to play that game so i guess this was the insane stunt she whipped it to derail the inevitable kind of reckless for my tastes one of the above statements is a fucking lie are you gutsy enough a gumshoe to spot it maybe she was justified in taking such an extreme measure i sure hadn't been taking her seriously she even warned me not to play it until i until she got back but i went ahead because i was too impatient Actually, now that I think about it, she was probably going to disarm it or such when she got back, seeing as, she uh, seeing as her objective had essentially been accomplished already by an actual assassination attempt. After that, I told her I would believe her, uh, believe her about everything. That probably made her feel guilty about setting me up, so she told me not to touch the file until she returned. Sounds about right. But then I went ahead and ran it anyway like a doofus. I think she wanted to be believed. Shucks. Am I an awful friend? Nope. I'm not sure about that. Before you go taking a massive crap all over your friendship credentials, consider this. Only she could manage to blow up your computer with a nasty death loop virus and somehow make you be the one to feel shitty about it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Or maybe you're the one who uniquely fills the predicate to that construction. I don't goddamn know. Your friendship with her is a half-drunken three-legged relay race, and the baton is a stick of dynamite, and the two of you are the only ones on the track. Me and English are watching from the bleachers, high-fiving constantly. I guess it's a pretty apt metaphor, even though it doesn't make the slightest bit of sense. Yes. 
I just wanted to start playing the game so badly. Now more than ever, I have reason to believe the stakes have increased dramatically. They have, and they will continue to do so. I think our dream counterparts are all marked for death, and if we uh, are to stand a chance, we must move quickly. I agree. I heard about your assassination on Prospect. Oh, she told you already? Who? RL? No, I read it in the newspaper. Um, are you being ironic again? No. I just picked it up in one of the sleazy Dursite tabloid rags. Sometimes they'll feature some pretty entertaining gossip about the royalty or whatever, but they're primarily dedicated to smearing Prospect. The press has a field day with the death of the Page of the Maid. Dursite? You mean the other planet, the evil one? Durs, yeah. I wouldn't call it evil, necessarily. That's a bit simplistic. The kingdom represents the forces of the opposition to Prospect and the four heroes. Us. Well, what did the story say about me? Dead was the big-ass headline. Then a photo of your dead body lying there, followed by a lot of bullshit slander. It was also reported your tower exploded. They couldn't find the body to give it a proper funeral. Probably incinerated. I didn't realize you'd woken up in the game already. When did that happen? I don't know, years ago. Don't really recall. I guess I shouldn't be act surprised you didn't tell me, what with your highfalutin secrecy. It's hard to explain. I was never technically asleep there. I was awake without realizing it. Then I realized it. And I sort of learned how to be awake there while awake here, too. I'm awake there now, albeit pretending to sleep. Pretending? Why? For one thing, it gets a bit distracting managing two alert bodies in different places at the same time. And for another thing, it's better to maintain appearances. Everyone on Durst believes their heroes haven't woken up yet, though they're both rumored to be very active sleepwalkers. Which is half true. She can't even seem to sleep still, goes wandering for days. Sometimes I gotta go around her up for some godforsaken cranny of the abyss, drag her tipsy ass home and tuck her back into bed. Maybe I'll chain her leg to the bed if she doesn't wake up soon. Though in light of the recent assassinations, her slumbering attraction to the Void probably works to her advantage. No one ever really knows where she is. I'm still not sure I'm following. Why are you maintaining the appearance of being asleep on Prospect? It seemed as if the people there regarded me and Jake very highly, like celebrated figures. Is it not the same way on Durs? No, it's essentially the same situation here. They glorify us the same way, almost like we're their purple pajama team mascots even though they will completely oppose our objective when all said and done. Kind of ridiculous, really. But even so, I think it's better to lay low, not alert anyone to my alertness. That way I can sneak around and gather information, do some reconnaissance before shit starts getting real. In other words, read newspapers, get a feel for the word on the street and such. As might a detective. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, among other things. Like keep an eye on agent activity. You mean secret agents? No, more like high-ranking officials. Judging from your knife wound, I'm betting you were the victim of the Archagent himself. You should feel honored, I guess. Who's that? A guy named Noir. Real nasty dude. Crazy ambitious. Loves knives. If we're going to stand any chance of winning this thing, I've got this nagging suspicion we're going to have to take him down first. And a feeling that nags equally is it ain't going to be easy. I guess I should find all that ominous. But I cannot lie, sir. Nothing you've said has made me one iota less excited to begin this adventure. Those dastardly agents can try to assassinate me all day they like. I just want to get started. That's the most awesome way to be, Jane. And it is again why you will be our leader. Sort of. Right, still fixing to pull the strings for us, per your extensive puppet metaphor? Pulling them as we speak. I'm having little Seb install a real copy of the client on another computer in your house. A clean computer, not any of this BCC Corp garbage you've got, uh, you've tend to accumulate. I'll have to insist from this point onward you employ neutral devices. That shit fucks with your head. Hmm, alrighty, I think I can make that concession. Once it's installed, I'll connect with you. I'll be your server player. I know this isn't what you were hoping for, but some impro improvisation is in order. While you get the ball rolling, I'll try to talk some sense into that mercurial booze hound. Sounds like a plan. I do hope she comes around. It'd be a bummer to play without her. She will. Say, do I even have any machines that survived the explosion besides this one? Do you even have any machines that didn't in inundate you with fucking hamburger helper ads and Guy Fieri's heinous propaganda? I guess not. Still, some nice things uh, were surely destroyed. I think that Detective Pony was caught in the blast. It's unlikely Acorn survived. A fitting end to the life of a moral compromise. So since I'm apparently one of the, uh, uh, since I'm apparently out of neutral devices, which computer is Seb installing the file on? On your dad's computer downstairs, the one in the study? Gotcha. 
My poor dad. He surely heard the explosion. I put him through so much today. Oh no. What? I just had a dreadful thought. The kitchen's just below my room. What if he'd be been begun baking his afternoon cake when my computer exploded? I wouldn't worry about it. Maybe, maybe I should go look? Though I'm a little afraid to. I think it'll take a lot more to kill that dude than a little falling debris. Trust me. <laughs> Completely unfazed. Like, I don't know. Kind of reminds me of that scene in Kingdom Hearts 2 when Goofy takes a giant boulder to the forehead and everyone's like, Oh my god, Goofy's dead. We need to go on a bloodlust-fueled revenge quest and kill as many heartless as possible. All will fall before us. And when they're all said and done, Goofy gets up and he's like, Jeez, guys, what'd I miss? I took a real bump on the head. And I'm like, why the fuck do you think that would kill him? Like, it makes sense for Sora to be like, Oh shit, Goofy's dead. But like, Mickey and Donald are there and they should be like, Oh, no, he's fine, but, like, those mother... Like, I'm okay with the revenge-fueled blood blood feud against these Heartless, but just to be like, oh, no, he's dead. Like, you know, like, they hit him in the strongest spot in his body. You know what I mean? Goofy's skull is so thick, you can't... It would reflect a fucking bullet. Anyway, sorry. I hope so. The Crockers have something of a legacy when it comes to losing forebears in mysterious explosions. It'd be so sad if I kept the tradition alive like this. The most you have to worry about is getting grounded back to the Stone Age. When you enter the session, he'll probably lock you up in a prison cell on Durst. Probably stick a huge safe in front of the bars for good measure. Now do me a favor and hop off the couch. Okay, what are you doing? Making room for something big. DS, deploy. You watch Destroy deploy some sort of mammoth instrument on your balcony? It's just as well he took over for Rollout. She probably would be destroyed half your house with that thing in her condition, but on the bright side, you're sure RL would be would have enjoyed a good nicker with you over the notion of DS deploying this mammoth instrument. You wonder what she could possibly be up to. While you're at it, you also wonder what the deal is with the cagey treatment of their names. Destry, Rolal, DS, RL, Strider, Lalonde. It's all starting to get a bit silly. Each of their full names has 11 characters, and you've been dancing around all but two. Maybe it's time you were formally introduced to the last two characters. One of the last two stands in her bedroom. It is a young lady. Due to an incident involving an purifier and an abridged, uh, unabridged Colonel Sassikers and a perfectly white cat, she will not be able to assist her Biffsy for some time. And due to the aggressive a concurrence of all that happens, all that takes place in Paradox Space, this incident has not happened yet. But what has happened yet was that this young lady's 13th birthday, it took place almost three years ago, and on the date her placronym was engraved. It was engraved with 11 letters to be precise, nine of which you are already familiar with. You figure it couldn't hurt to take a peek at the engraving. You've been dying to get the scoop on those last two mystery characters. Oh, right, I forgot. These characters are 16 years old. Maybe that has something to do with it, you know? Like, I don't know, I feel like 13-year-olds are definitely, like, way more honest, and then things get, like, weirdly political and backstabby at 16, you know what I mean? Examine Placronym. Hey, get that damn cat out of the way. Cat, move tail. Roxy Lalonde. Thank you, cat who is probably Jasper's. The final two chromosomic symbols have been released from their fluffy, twitching prison. Examine Room. Your name is Roxy. God damn, do you love wizards. You wish and hope they are real, and that so too is their magics and stuff. You enjoy writing fan prose for said magical men, but you think maybe it's not so great? You are, however, quite great at the esoteric sciences such as ectobiology, dark fenestrology, and the delicate art of a purification. You've tended to accrue dead preserved specimens from your experiments, little to none which aren't feline. You aren't one to shy away from a bit of gaming, particularly the sort of well past its prime. Uh, you have a real soft spot for old school technology. It's fair to say that most of your leanings are governed by a bent for nostalgia. Your coding cred is totes ridic, basically making you the hottest shit hacks or bitch you ever knew. As deadly the grit ass, she is beautiful. You're known to non seldomly employ a roguish demeanor towards the fellas, a habit not especially jeopardized by your non infrequent inebriation. Which is to say, against the better judgment of one your age, you like to dip into the sauce now and then. Unless your mom is looking, which happens to be virtually never. And considering she's been known by the knowledgeable to be in possession of vision omnifold, this strikes you as a particularly stunning lapse in parental diligence. But you have good friends and many distractions to fill this void in your life. What will you do? Roxy, 
We are like an alley cat and blow bubbles in your drink. Roxy is not empowered to resurrect this crusty old gag template because all of the sudden, all of a sudden, all of the sudden, she's too busy being the other guy. We have absolutely got to peep the last two letters of this Max Chill dude's name on the devil fucking double. Examine placronym. Hey, clear out of that. Hey, clear out. Hey, clear out that stupid pony. What is this, some sort of miniature paddock? Thanks, Pony, who is presumably a tiny maple hoof for some reason. The final two diluvial symbols have been unearthed from countless crushing ounces of slumbering pony. Dirk Strider. Examine room. Your name is Dirk. Holy shit, do you love puppets. You possess the extreme dexterity to operate your false friends unseen, that is, when you are not preambulatory through your lovingly imbued mechanization. You dig right in cognitive algorithms for said apocryphal men, and you think maybe that's fucking dope? Guess what else is dope? Everything else you do. You're a sick, wicked autodidact on ancient civilizations, a self-made master of mythologue, and a preternatural pop culture academy. If you weren't so damn aloof and actually let people get a load, you might get described all kinds of ways. Maybe tagged as a renaissance ninja, philosopher prince, and flash step puppeteer, or perhaps a pantheonic ironicist, gangsta logician, lucid waker, and dursite spy. Screw descriptors, though, as if the shits you give ain't nil. You're cool with dabbling in the fine sequential arts, and your work could be viewed by some as borderline pornographic. And to make those philistines, you'll be hard heard wondering, what the fuck do you mean borderline? Against the better judgment of your age, you build robots, set them to kill mode, and spar with them to the death. That is, when you're not sendificating them to friends, or dueling them with rap lyrics. But you try to cool it on the deathmatch stuff when your bro is looking. Which is virtually never. And considering he's had a reputation staked on some sort of martial nobility, this strikes you as a staggering oversight and brotherly vigilance. You don't have the heart to hold it against him, though. What will you do? Dirk. Shut your ass and twitch like a proboscis. There's no way in hell you were going to give this gag the time of day, even if you weren't suddenly totally lambasted by the character select screen again from way out of left field inside your glasses. Once again, you're grabbing the plush by the rump. You're in absolute command of your destiny, as long as you don't pick the two characters who are grayed out, which is universally understood UI convention for non-clickability. Also, as long as both other available choices are finished being drawn, we're, pa we're passing out free will like cheap cigars. Let's start with Roxy. You are now Roxy. What were you up to again? You were floating somewhere in the non-linear time stew of paradox space, and we were hoping to get a handle on the exact chronology of your situation. Perhaps your successive actions will oblige us? Yeah, you aren't really listening. You're just gonna do whatever the hell you want. Roxy, grab that sweet gun. You pick up your high-octane laser gun. It's powered by the most deadly sciences you know of. You keep a couple specifist allocations in your portfolio on standby. You try to stay as sharp as possible in unarmed combat because you never know when you'll get ambushed. It's dangerous out there. Roxy, examine Dead Mutant Collection. The biggest one has been around for as long as you remember, encased in that glass-like material. You've considered giving it a name, but it always struck you as a little morbid to name a dead cat. The others were the result of a few experimental mishaps before you got the hang of, ecto of the ectobiology equipment. You keep them around to remind you of the perils of the inexact science, and also because they're weird looking and kind of cute. You've since cloned many healthy felines, but they all live in the laboratory out back. Your pet cat doesn't really get along with the other ones, so you don't want to upset him. Roxy, capture log one. You took the biggest one into your message in a bottle, Modus. These little guys are really are quite handy for busting through windows whenever you're ready to christen a new fenestrated plane. Roxy, take books. You take the first six books of your mom's best-selling series, Complacency of the Learned. She made an impossible fortune off of these books, considering how dark and inaccessibly written they were for young readers. More money than the U.S. financial system could even account for is legitimately circulating in the economy. Many suspected real-life witchcrafts were involved, which is what some believe discouraged criminal investigation into the matter. The feds were afraid. The Baroness, nervous. God, you hope that's all true. Roxy, examine the complacency of the learned poster. Some original edition art from one of the books. It features the androgynous young apprentice, Calmasis, who throughout the series plays the role of the anti-hero and chief antagonist. She slash he convinces fellow disciples to rebel against Zazerpan's vaunted complacency and one by one hunts down each wizard. All 12 are killed, but the predicant scholar himself forcing a showdown. 
The poster depicts the notorious chess match between Kalmasis and Zazerpan. Zazerpan had a reputation for being unbeatable. He had never lost a match, even to the gods, but his apprentice was able to beat him in the wizard's duel by first becoming checkmated, and through some unprecedented enchantment, continuing to play beyond the death of the king. You love your mom's books and find them heavily inspiring, but you can't help but feel the work is exhaustingly heavy-handed at times. You kind of prefer to write more lighthearted things, actually crack a joke now and then, you know? Roxy, say hi to Cat. Your cat Friglish hops down on the bed and gre to greet you, and immediately situates himself on something important, one of your creative writing journals. You, name him at, you named him after your favorite wizard from uh, Complacency of the Learned. He was just such an endearing, bumbling fellow before he was murdered. Kalmasis put an insidious curse on him, which caused him to go insane over several years. He began filling a book with all of his arcane knowledge, which was said to be limitless. The tome grew to monumental proportions and became a virtually unreadable patchwork of impenetrable erudition. When the young wizard finally caught up with him, he was quaking incoherently. Uh, a quaking, incoherent madman. Sleesh, see, she slash he put him out of his misery by crushing him to death with his own massive text. You just think it's a fitting name for him for some reason. The macabre demise notwithstanding, of course. Roxy, take journals. Okay. It's, cl it's clear to me that complacency of the learned is somewhat prognosticative, but I don't understand exactly how it applies. I think we'll understand exactly who Kalmasis is later, and like what the chess game is, but who are the twelve? I mean, I know that we've got twelve trolls, but even so, we've got four humans and four humans. Are there only four trolls remaining? I feel like so. Like, that could be the twelve. Uh, but then the answer is, like, who is Friglish? Anyway, Roxy, take the journals. You politely scoot Friglish off the books. That a boy. Technically, only one of these books is yours. The writing journal. You're pretty secretive about your writing. Sometimes even you can hardly bear to read it. You're highly aware of the formidable writerly shadow cast over you, and can be critical to the point of embarrassment over your work. Just how drunk were you when you wrote this? You often wonder to yourself. You don't think you'll be peeking at it soon. Maybe later. The other book is another point of embarrassment for completely different reasons. Roxy, read the other book. This is Jake's private journal. One day when you were feeling especially frisky, you swiped it with your purifier. Bark, 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 bark. Not feeling, expect not re actually expecting it to work, but when you debated with yourself for weeks about whether to read it, when you finally took a peek, you were strangely relieved to find all this nonsense instead of his private thoughts. But you still don't, uh, you still didn't have to have it in you to cop to the theft. You just agreed what a shame it was about his missing book. You have no idea what these letters mean. Some kind of code? Bark? Crab? Abracadabra? You have no clue what was running through that kid's head. Not unlike always. Roxy. Get your little ray gun. It isn't a ray gun, it's your purifier. Pretty much the only crocker tech you can bring yourself to use. It's just too handy not to. You just plug in the coordinates you want to nab something from, point it when you're where you want to purify, and shoot. It'll make that thing a purify right then and there, assuming no temporal conflicts. Piece of cake. Not crocker brand cake though, because fuck that witch. Roxy, you're thirsty. This isn't a command. Excuse me, but you beg to differ. You poured that beautiful martini a little while ago, and you've been letting it gather cobwebs while you horse around with random shit in your room. Such a crime. Roxy, sip martini thoughtfully. Damn it, this is the wrong stock reaction. You will not stand for this outrageous mis misrepresentation of your beverage enjoyment. Delicious. Roxy, sip martini more thoughtfully than that. That's much better. As much as you enjoy an afternoon cocktail, you have to remember to pace yourself with these things. They're crazy strong and tend to make you kind of sleepy. Oh my, how inviting does that soft plush pile look about now? Quite, you think. Roxy, examine plush pile. You like to ensconce yourself in this friendly heap when you play games. Gosh, it looks soft. Your eyelids are getting heavy. Roxy, succumb to unfathomable booze snooze. Uh-oh, there you go a wobbling. Look out below. Roxy, blackout. Nap time. Roxy, sleepwalk. Even in death by Clark Powell.
Roxy, wake up.